On today's podcast, we are with another dear friend, Jeff Ramhan. I have known Jeff for, my God, it goes back maybe 25 years. When Jeff was working in the record business and the music industry out here in California, he's been an A&R executive, he's been a journalist, and now he is the chair at the NYU's Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music. We discuss his career, we discuss the changes, we discuss the landscape of education, music business education, and its importance to people in in the business today, people who want to be in the business. We talk about NYU's program and what he's learning from his students. So it's a really great conversation. You don't want to miss it. Insiders, are you ready? Welcome to Mubu TV's Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage artists and music business professionals who are dedicated to having a successful career in the new music industry. Here are your hosts, Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Welcome back, insiders, to another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage your music career. On today's episode, we sit down with Jeff Rabhan, who is the chair at NYU's Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music. We discuss his career in A&R, artist management, as well as the role education offers those working toward a career in the music business and how it can effectively assist you in that process, as well as much, much more. You don't want to miss it. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hey, insiders. Are you looking to take your music career to the next level? Then you need to know about the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label A&R, music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 28 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a and Registry, the Film and Television Music Monthly, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in print, PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit them now at musicregistry.com and receive a 10% discount by using coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Welcome back, insiders. Today's featured interview is with a good friend of mine, Jeff Rabhan. Jeff is the chair of the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music at NYU. And this is a subject that I, you know, is very dear and close to Eric and I because we've based our whole professional lives on educating artists. We think it's such an important factor. And to be able to have a discussion with somebody who works at NYU, who, you know, the, the program was formed by a man who I worked with in the music industry, Clive Davis. And it's one of the leading programs in the nation on this particular aspect. And we got into a lot of great discussions with Jeff about how the program prepares students for a career in today's industry, what specific skills they look for in the students that they enroll. And Jeff comes from the music business. You know, he was an A&R executive at Electra at Atlantic. He worked in artist management. So, you know, he doesn't come from just an academic background. So we got into a lot of interesting things about, you know, the business and about schooling and about, you know, what students need to know to prepare themselves for a career in the business today. Yeah, I thought it was interesting about, you know, some of the really salient points that he was talking about was, you know, what to teach the students, what were the right things to teach students, and about becoming an entrepreneur, which is something that we've been talking about extensively on the show, Yes, where it's no longer about, I want to get signed and sell 10 million records. It's about, you know, your business is a brand. You have to become an entrepreneur now, and you have to build your business. No longer being done by somebody else, it's being done by you. So, you know, and and again, to reiterate, yeah, his background, going from journalism to A&R, and then A&R to management at one of the leading management companies at the time, the firm. So yeah, this is a really, really great conversation and uh, very excited to share this with you guys today. So insiders, sit back, relax, and enjoy our featured interview with Jeff Rabhan. Hey, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I'm, I'm happy to do it. Great. You know, I want to I want to start the, the interview with you. Do you remember in your life uh, when you made the decision that the music industry was going to be your career path? You know, it, it's it's funny. I mean, it was one of those decisions that was made for me. You know, it was, it was it, in, in my mind, there really wasn't ever a question. I, I mean, you know, from the time that I was, uh, you know, re- really, really, you know, 14, 15, 16, I knew that, you know, 
music was something I wanted to be part of my life. But, you know, I grew up in a small town in the South. And so, you know, I didn't know anything about the about the music business at all. And so I had no idea what that meant or, or but I just knew that I wanted to to be part of it in some way. So I, I would say probably around my mid teens or so. Let me ask you, Jeff, this is Eric, by the way. Thank you so much for joining us on this. We're really excited to have you. Um, yeah. Upon upon graduating with a degree in journalism from NYU, you were offered a position at Rolling Stone, followed by a stint at Spin. What was your view of the music business at the time you worked with at the two media giants? Well, you, you know what's 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 funny is is that you know I I knew a lot about music, uh, and I had worked. You know, I, I knew a lot about music, historically speaking. I was a student of, of just, you know, musical history. And I worked for an artist manager in my junior and senior years of college. So I had a, a little bit of knowledge about, you know, about the business itself. But, you know, I, I was I was still pretty naive. I mean, it was an interesting time. It was the early 90s. You know, it was, it was, it was you know, a grunge world we were living in. And it was Cobain and Cornell. And, you know, it, 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 it was... It was an interesting time, but I really didn't know a lot about about the business itself. I just knew it was I knew it was an exciting time, an exciting thing, and I wanted to be as close to it as I, as I could be. You went on from those jobs to your first A and R job, I believe, which was at Atlantic Records as senior director of A and R and soundtracks. And A and R jobs in that era were very highly coveted positions. How did you get the job? You know, I, I, I one, one of my writing one of my writing assignments uh, was to come out to L.A. I was still New York based at the time, and I was interviewing Cypress Hill, and I became close with their manager at the time. and And their manager was living with one of the heads of of uh, one of the VPs of A and R at Atlantic, and we became friends. and And one thing led to another. I mean, they you know they really took a risk on me. I didn't have a lot of experience. I certainly didn't know how to make records. You know, I was 24 at the time, and and uh, uh, and they took a they took a risk on me and moved me out to LA and I and I started I started at Atlantic then without really knowing how records were made or, or really how record companies worked. Um, you know, my previous experience had been dealing with artists one on one and doing you know more sort of journalistic work. So y- y- you know, I mean, it's funny when you think about it. I mean, A and R is is so different today than it was then in many ways, but but also fundamentally still the same. But but you know it was a it was a learning curve for me no question about it yeah I think it's I think it's funny that, that, that certain aspects are the same fundamentally but the process of what A and R it you know I, as I'm fond of saying in my classes Jeff A and R was a much more faith based business back then before technology and a lot of that faith based of like you know I have faith in my abilities or I have faith in my you know taste. And we as a label have faith in you as an artist that we believe that there's a market for you out there. Now, nine times out of 10, you were wrong, but so much of that is gone today from the A&R process. So, so much of that is gone from the A&R process, but I'll, I'll also say that, you know, if, if you look at, if, if you look at the, the, the numbers, um, you know, certainly with major labels, you know, over the last 20 years, it's still, you know, 15% are paying the bills of the other 85 that are failures. So, you know, the faith-based model, I, I, it, you know, while certainly doesn't have the research behind it and the numbers behind it, oftentimes uh, it comes out in the wash. You know, I, I think that, you know, there's still something to be said for that. And I, I think that any any head of A&R at any major label would still tell you that if they see something great and they believe in it, that they're going to sign that artist regardless of what the numbers are or if they feel like they can make a great record or whatever it may be. But yeah, it's, it's a very different time. You know, a r guys aren't seeing three bands a night anymore. You know, that you go to an A&R department and you've got, you know, throngs of, of young men and young women with headphones on, you know, scouring the Internet. I, it, you know, it's, it, it's, it's different. Not better, not worse, but, but different. So, Jeff, you know, after that, you then became the head of soundtracks at Elektra. And soundtracks were very big business at that time and a major source of income if they hit. What skills did that particular job teach you, number one? And was your background in A&R helpful to you with that gig? I, I mean, you know, s- soundtracks, uh, it's a really good question, you know, because because s- soundtracks really, uh, I, I, I liken working in soundtracks to, to really, you know, wor- working on Middle East peace, you know, being a diplomat, diplomacy, because, you know, you've got a director, you've got a producer, you've got a studio, You've got a music supervisor and you've got a label all trying to agree on the same, you know, 12 songs. And it, it just it, it rarely happens in a meaningful way. And even when it does, can you can you license them and get them? Um, 
And I think as soundtracks became, you know, big, bigger and bigger business, it became increasingly difficult um, to be able to, 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 to make meaningful projects that were accompaniments to films uh, for any kind of uh, uh, reasonable amount of dollars, which I think ultimately was the demise of the soundtrack business. They cost too much to, to acquire and too much to make. And it was too hard to do. But it, I mean, ultimately, it really it was. It was trying to get everybody on the same page. And, 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 and it's an exhausting it's an exhausting process. It really was. But, you know, look, at the end at the end of the day, I, you know, my philosophy really is you know, I, I, like many, many people in the music industry, you know, I've, I've had 10 different jobs, but it's really ultimately all the same job. You know, it's all about communicating, you know, creative ideas. It's all about, you know, standing up for what you believe in. It's all about being able to work well with others, be convincing, be a cheerleader and, you know, and just work hard. I mean, you know, really being, you know, being an A&R person, being a manager, uh, you, you know, even being a journalist at times, it's, it's very similar. You know, you're 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 fighting for for a voice at all times. So I always say it, 10 different jobs, but it's really all the same job. Right. Let me ask you, you know, you then went on to work as an independent music supervisor and A&R consultant. Was this the first time you were ever totally like independent? It, it was. And, you know, and, and I, uh, <laughs> you know, the first project that I that I uh, I supervised, my first independent project, um, actually my first two projects, one as an A&R, uh, you know, sort of sort of shopping, you know, artist and one as a music supervisor. I got very lucky and I was like, wow, I, I got this covered. And of course, you know, I, nothing else I ever did came as came as close on a success level as either one of them. So, you know, it was it, 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 uh, it, it was it was a. It was a, uh, a humbling time for me because, you know, my first film project was Scream, which was a massive, you know, right. juggernaut success project. And, you know, I, I shopped Hanson and got them their record deal at Mercury and and they exploded. And, you know, I, I learned some really valuable lessons, you know, with, with, with Scream. You know, I, I, you know, I had a, I did a number of projects after that, and and didn't come anywhere close to having the success, and realized that you know, really, no matter what you do, you put your best foot forward, but it's out of your hands. And when it came to you know doing doing A and R, you know, I, I learned a very valuable lesson because I, uh, you know I, I had a I had a dispute with Mercury, and they didn't want to pay me for bringing them the act, and and the and, and the boys exploded, and I ended up in a in a lawsuit. And I learned a really valuable lesson then too, which is, you know, if there's something that you really believe in, you know, good, good deals make, you know, good partners. And, and if you do really believe in something, why give it away? And that's really when I ultimately decided to, um, to, to start managing artists. Cause I, I just didn't want to, I didn't, I never wanted to put myself in a position of having to, to, to sue anybody to get what was rightfully mine. Jeff, it was also during this time that you discovered the Grammy award winning singer songwriter, Michelle Branch, and you ultimately started to manage her. Um, she had, you know, a very big uh, career and a lot of success. Tell us, how did you find her and what was it about her that you were drawn to? I mean, honestly, it was, it, it was, it was, it was pure luck. I, you know, it was, you know, I, I like to always um, I like to always believe in, in, in not only in music, but in life, you know, one door closes, another one opens. You know, I was I was uh, living in L.A. and and, uh, you know, was in this and, and, and you know, was, I was a young guy was this, and then this horrible dispute with a major record company over a over a, a worldwide, you know, juggernaut of an artist with with Hanson. And I went to Sedona, Arizona for the weekend and, uh, and I got roped into taking a timeshare tour and. And, uh, you know, the, the woman, uh, given the tour said, you know, what do you, what do you do for a living? And I said, I work in music. She said, Oh, you know, you have to meet a little star of Sedona. And, you know, I'm thinking to myself, you know, there's, there's 1200 people here, you, you, you know, <laughs> and, you, you know, I, and, and, and I said, Oh, why don't I just say I'm a teacher or something else? And, uh, and, and sure enough, you know, she said, you know, my goddaughter, you know, she's, she's, you know, 14 years old and she's a big Hanson fan and blah, blah, blah. And, and I said, well, you know, here's my, here's my phone number. She could call me. And, and sure enough, I took the tour and I came back and Michelle was there with her Hanson CD. She'd stolen her neighbor's golf cart and, and driven up to, uh, to meet me. And, and we stayed in touch and, um, 
and I ended up going to Phoenix and recording some demos and and sent them out, you know, to a couple of friends to to get their opinion. And one of them was uh, was 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 Danny Strick. And you know, over time, she and I started working together more seriously. And obviously, I was I was managing her and I ended up sending them to uh, you know to Danny at Maverick and I just to find out what he thought. And he said, I I, I love her. I want to sign her. And I, I I couldn't believe it. I was I was in shock. Wow. wow. You then went to work at one of the biggest and most prestigious management companies in the business, The Firm, which was run by artist managers Jeff and Michael Green, uh, where you work with Linkin Park, Jennifer Lopez, Enrique Iglesias, Snoop Dogg, among others. You know, what were the most significant things that you learned working over at The Firm? I, you know, what's funny is like, uh, you know, the all the people that I worked with at The Firm, you know, when when when, when I, I see them or run into them, you know, everybody sort of has this, you know, it's almost like a, uh, <laughs> you know, it's like it's like the guys you survive basic training with, you know, like there's this, there's this sort of wink and a nod and an understanding that, you know, you, you, you made it through. I mean, it, it was a crazy, crazy time in that. You know, you had one of one of, you know, the hardest working, one of the smartest, you know, most most challenging people running the company. And Jeff and I are, are still friends. In fact, I actually sent him an email today about something, you, you know, like you, you had a guy who was who was just the smartest guy in the room and worked harder than everybody else. And it, and it elevated everybody's game. I mean, it was it was it was bananas. It was a crazy time. But, you know, what I what I did learn was that, you, you know, even in a in a business where you know most managers are very protectionist and historically it always worked alone, you know even in a, in a big environment like that, you know there was a lot of teamwork, there was a lot of help, there was a lot of you know a lot of shared victories, and I really did learn to to kind of you know let go of a lot of things at that time. I mean, you know, in, in you know for example, when I was working on Kelly Clarkson, you know there were four or five of us working on Kelly Clarkson, so. You know, I dealt with the label and the A and R. Pete Katz has handled all the touring, and you know, we surrounded things, and everybody really got to do what they what they did best. Um, in many ways, you know, and and in Jeff's vision, it was a company. It was it was a company that had 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 real personalities and real leaders as individual individual managers. But many of the clients really were company clients, with Kelly being one of them. Okay, so that was that was interesting, and also you know. It was just batshit crazy times, you know, a lot of big acts, a lot of excess, a lot of amazing tours, amazing people, crazy personalities. And I, I mean, it, it, it really was just an unbelievable time, I, an unbelievable time in my life. I, that's all I could say. And he's still managing artists today. He's still managing artists and he's, he's got a basketball league and he does some TV and he's got a, he's got a few things going on. I, I actually haven't been I haven't stayed in great touch. I'm not sure, you know, exactly what he's doing at this point. I run into him from time to time. Um, but, yeah, he's he's always got his hand in, in, in a few interesting things. I think he still uh, manages the Backstreet Boys, if I'm not mistaken. I'm, I'm, I'm not even sure. You know, it was at this point after you left the firm, I believe, that you launched your own company, which was Three Ring Projects. And you had huge success with an American Idol winner named Elliot Yamin. And the interesting thing about him is that, as I remember, is that his debut was like one of the biggest chart debuts ever by a new artist on an independent label in the history of SoundScan, which it, it debuted at number one on the indie album chart and number three on Billboard's Top 200. L let me ask you, what was the thinking behind putting him out on the, you know, Sony ATV's Hickory label? What what was the thinking behind that? Why Why that as opposed to getting him, you know, just a normal deal at that time? You know what? I mean, to be perfectly honest with you, uh, Nobody wanted to sign him. Nobody, nobody was interested in signing him. And 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 it was what made that project great was it wasn't anybody was so brilliant. It was it was a combination of you know Josh Abraham, who I managed as a producer, you know who who owns Pulse and and, and Pulse Recording. I managed as a producer was one of my best friends. Elliot was his cousin, and Danny Danny, who was the president at Sony ATV, and I had worked so well together as a manager and as the A and R, you know, and we, we all got together, and, and and I said I'll do the managing. Josh said I'll, I'll deliver a finished record. Danny said I'll help find the songs, and everybody again did what they did best, and and three people got together. We put the project together. Elliot could sing his ass off, and and honestly, we got lucky. You know, we we you know Danny got us got us a you know a a, a big hit song. Elliot sang his ass off. Josh delivered a record at a very reasonable price that he did at, at Pulse with a lot of his guys and you know and 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 Sony ATV put some money behind it and um 
you know, I'd like to tell you that, you know, we were, we were brilliant. We weren't brilliant. We just, we, we believed in ourselves and, and we thought that we could, we could do, we thought we could make a great record and, and it would have a shot. And, and that's all you could really hope for. But nobody else wanted to sign him. We, we had tried to shop him a little bit, then said, wait a minute, we can do this. No, but you know, you just said the, the, you just said the main ingredient, which is that you had the faith and the belief that you could do this and you were willing to put your own time energy and you know the label which was you know hickory and danny was willing to put resources behind it i mean it's a very you know it's an interesting story when when i hear this because it reminds me do you know the story behind um oh what is the band on glass note um mumford and sons do you know the story behind them it's very, i've heard i've heard i've heard bits and pieces of it over time it's, it's a so very funny. very interesting story they got signed to a major label over there in england it was a worldwide deal with universal they went out on the island label the record did you know very very good business they then uh shopped it to america and the responses they got from the 11 universal labels were the following are you insane what are you smoking are you high you must be crazy not in this lifetime i mean these were actual responses that like all the you know interscope island def jam i mean Geff, all of them sent back to the a and r person and finally when they exhausted the resources universal had to give them a release for america wow and it was at that time that it got shopped to daniel glass who said this is amazing i believe in this i i feel i can do so and and he spent a lot of time and energy where well the rest is history as they say but it was that belief and when you just told that story jeff it's like that's not a common story. That's not common for like a publisher to put money in and to say, you know, we will put this out and to have it pay off so handsomely. I mean, it's it goes back to that whole notion of, you know, A&R being truly, in, in your example, a faith-based business and that faith totally paid off. You, you know what, too? I, I mean, you know, when we started Three Ring Projects, the idea was, you know, we wanted to try and do... I mean, philosophically, like I really wanted to try and do things, you know, we didn't want to, we didn't want to break the model. We didn't want to break the mold. We didn't want to, you know, we weren't trying to reinvent the wheel. We just wanted to, we just wanted to do things differently, you know? So when, you know, Michelle wanted to do a country record, you know, she did the records project. We had a number one record with Leave the Pieces. It was the first time a pop artist had had an you know, that's very common now, you know, very common now for artists to release independently and success. It wasn't common then. But but, you know, what I will say is like, you, you know, you know, even with like with the with the with the Elliott Project, he came in fifth on American Idol. You know, it was seasoned. God knows whatever. All these contestants were souvenirs of the TV show. We're like, we this kid has an audience. He has a voice. Partner up with people you trust, you know, you like, and 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 put your best foot forward. Same thing with Michelle. It's like you know, we 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 you know, we made it. We made what we thought was a really great record, a beautiful record. We had you know, we had support from from Warner in Nashville. We were missing a hit song. We went back to John Shanks to pr to produce a song. You know, John produced Michelle's first two records, and you know, and, and we got a hit out of it. So, you know, for for me, it really was just like trusting the artist instincts. I mean, that was Michelle's idea. She really wanted to do this to to cross over, and go back to, to you know to 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 tried and true formulas. And and you know what I love most about that story more than anything else is that. You know, John Shanks, who hadn't had any success, you know, had a little success as a producer, but certainly wasn't known when he produced Michelle. I had no success as a manager when he produced Michelle. You know, we both came up together on that record. John, you know, the rest is history. He's one of the most successful producers of the last, you know, 20 years. John's son is going to be a freshman in my program in three weeks. You know, like, to me, like, that is, there's nothing fucking better than that. Yeah. Yeah, that's coming nothing. full circle. I mean, like, I, 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 you know, I know the kid. And I knew him when he was little, but like the, to me, like that is um, that's what it's all about, you know. To to me, like that to, that means the world to me, you know. To to be able to 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 have that experience in a different life in a different generation with people that have have been so valuable to me in terms of of of, of me having having you know a, a, a great life in this business, you yeah. know. To be able to do that, it, there's nothing better. And it's a perfect segue into our next uh, question yeah, for you. Well, 
shit is boring. I don't want to talk about this. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't, you know what? I like, I, I like to say there's a reason why the windshield's bigger than the rear view mirror. I, let's look forward. <laughs> which, which we are, yeah. Well, That's what we're going to transition yeah, into. Yeah, l- let me ask you, in 20. 20- in 2010, you became the chair at NYU's Clive Davis uh, Institute of Recorded Music back in, in New York City. What prompted you to give up management to take the job? You know what? I, you know, I, I went through, I, I think, you know, sort of a, a bit of a transformation. You know, I had my own business. I was spending a lot of time on the road. My kids were young. I didn't love running the business. And I, I don't think I was particularly great at running a business. I thought I was a really good manager but an okay, you know, guy at, at running the business and I, I wasn't loving it. And, you know, and, and something sort of came to me, you know, I, I, I loved working with artists, but you know, I, I, I don't remember exactly what had happened, but you know, for a variety of reasons, I think, you know, I parted ways with a few artists and, and, you know, management was starting to feel very transient to me. And, and I wanted to, you know, I, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to miss, you know, my kids event and life events or miss being home or spend my time in airports, you know, for people that ultimately I didn't think were going to be in my life long term. I wanted to have more, more solid relationships. And, and I think I, I had a, a bit of a midlife crisis where I just sort of took a look back and I said, you know, I don't really love what I'm doing. I don't, I don't love where I live and, and I don't love, you know, the quality of the relationships. And, and I knew full well that I was fully to blame for it. So, you know, I, I started, uh, you know, first thing I did is I reached out to, uh, to Kenny Kerner and I, and I, 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 I did a couple guest spots over at the uh, Musicians Institute and, and I got a holiday card from the Clive Davis Department of Recorded Music at New York University, I, which I went to NYU and I worked in music. I'd never even heard of it. And I responded to the holiday card. I said, hi, my name is Jeff. I'm a manager. I'm in LA. I'm in New York all the time. If you ever need a guest speaker, you know, let me know thinking, you know, I'm so magnanimous and offering my service. <laughs> yeah, I get a dozen of those a month. I, you, you know, I, I mean, people, you know, people always want to come in and speak. But luckily, the the gentleman on the other side, you know, Jason King, who was the creative director at the time, said, you know, hey, I, you know, I know your name, and I'll be in L.A. for the Grammys in a, in a month. Let's let's get together. I, I wasn't a great student. I certainly didn't love school, and I didn't know a damn thing about about running one. And um, you know, Jason came out and he said, you know, we're you certainly you're welcome to 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 come in but you know we're looking for a chair of the program and i i I said what's that i had no idea and he explained it to me and i said great that i can do that in la right and he said no of of course not you know you have to be there and i said well you know i'm not moving to new york and they sure as hell aren't hiring a guy like me anyway but i said let me throw my hat in the ring and 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 uh you know maybe i'll meet some interesting people or something good will come out of it and i can i can be of service and enjoy what i'm doing a lot more maybe you know do something. I wanted. I wanted to build a relationship, and one thing led to the other, and I ended up uh, being offered the position. And I, 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 I couldn't say no. It was too. It was too amazing of an opportunity to, uh, to to pass up. And you know, it was a three-year job that can be renewed for another three. And I'm going into year ten. So you know, it's it's been a it's been a really great journey. We've we've, we've doubled in size. When I get back to New York, we're about to move from our eight thousand square foot space into thirty six thousand square feet. You know, we we built a new space. The Beastie Boys donated you know an oscilloscope, their studio where they made all their records. We've got a Clive Davis dedicated you know. Um, uh, gallery of all of his memorabilia. It's really going to be spectacular. I'm, I'm super excited because ultimately this is, I think this is the realization of, of the vision of the pro- program when it was founded. And and truth be told, you know, that the, and I say this to people all the time, the program was, was, was amazing before I got there. They just didn't have a loud mouth to tell everybody. So I, I said, you know, I, I can do this job. You know, they didn't have great industry relationships. And they didn't have a strong board and they ha- hadn't done a lot of outreach. But the program was amazing and the people there were amazing. And, and they, 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 they they understood what 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 a music business program really needed to be. They just needed somebody with a megaphone. And, and, and I, I thought to myself, I, I could do that. And the rest of it, I, I'm going to have to learn quickly. And, and sure enough, I had a lot of help. And uh, but the program was 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 right minded from the very beginning. And it's, it's just grown from there. Hey, insiders, we hope that you've been enjoying our featured interview. Stay tuned because we've got so much more value coming your way. But before we dive back in, a word from our sponsor. Hey, Rich. You're the founder, CEO, 
legend of Music Business Registry. Tell us what the Music Business Registry is all about. Well, what it's about, Eric, is it's a company that is designed to provide the most accurate and up-to-date contact information for the music business. So if someone is looking to reach the A&R community, if someone is looking to reach music publishers, if someone needs to reach artist managers, if someone needs to reach music attorneys, if someone's looking to place their music into film and television and needs to reach all the music supervisors, that's the contact information that we provide. We've been doing it for 28 years. We're sort of the industry standard, if you will, uh, for the music business uh, and, and have been serving them since 1992. So that's what we do. Amazing. So if I wanted to find out, let's say uh, a and uh, people from uh, Warner Brothers, let's say, I can just go in there and find that in the A&R registry? Absolutely. You'll find all of the Warner Brothers in there. You'll find the Warner Brothers in LA, Warner Brothers in New York, Warner Brothers in Nashville, Warner Brothers in London, Warner Brothers, you know, probably in Australia as well. So those are the, the main territories that we cover. Amazing. And we're offering all of our insiders right now that are listening, if you visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout, you'll get a 10% discount off your first order. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. Anything else you want to say, Rich? Well, when you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. You know, Jeff, it's interesting listening to you. I mean, you've been in the business now for over 25 years, and you've seen the the radical upheaval and revolution that we've gone through and continue to experience at a faster rate of change, I think, than ever before, especially as it pertains to how artists connect with their audiences and build careers for themselves, as well as the, you know, evolving way that we as an industry continue to foster that relationship between artists and audience. And, you know, I'm curious, as chair of the department at at Clive Davis Recorded Institute, can, can you speak to how your program prepare students for the music industry landscape of today? Because it's a totally different one than you and I have been talking about. A hundred percent. I mean, you know, I, I think that, you know, one of the things that we really try to focus on is, you know, ultimately it's, it's you know, we're, we're not, we're not trying to teach them to, to, you know, how, how to produce better or how to sing better or how to play better. I mean, we, you know, we're, 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 we're a unique program in that, you know, it's, it's a, it's a bachelor of fine arts in recorded music. It's the only degree of its kind anywhere in the world. We don't, you know, we don't teach, you know, we have, we, we, we offer musicianship, you know, we offer a songwriting class. There is one theory class everybody has to take, but it doesn't matter what you do. Everybody takes the exact same 56 credits. Doesn't matter if you're a journalist and you don't play any instruments or you're a producer and you play 12 instruments. You've had, you know, 10 years of theory or you don't know what theory is. Everybody takes the same core. And for us, it's it's about giving, you know, it's it's about kids coming in with a passion for the music industry, whether they're performers, producers, writers, manage, whatever it is they want to do, digital marketing, whether they want to create festivals, doesn't make any difference. We want, just want to fill up their toolbox with all the tools that they need to be able to build an entrepreneurial, creative music venture on their own. And that means that they're sending out resumes or waiting to be discovered, then we didn't do our job. And it doesn't mean that you're not going to become a better singer or a better writer or a better producer when you're there, but that's not what we're trying to do. What we're trying to do is give you holistic, give any student a holistic education in all the areas of the music industry. So ultimately, you know, to, to get back to your question, it, it's about empowerment. It's about letting them know what they need to know and what they need to learn in order to be as self-sufficient as possible. And that means, you know, not, 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 you know, painting a picture of, of, of arenas and, 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 you know, worldwide fame and success, but it's, Hey, what tools do you need to be able to make a living doing what it is you love to do? And, and, and that's fundamentally what it is that we do and what we focus on. And, and I think we're doing a good job at it. You know, look, it's, it's, it's a, it's a moving target. You know, we'll, we'll spend a year developing a class. We'll offer it once and then it's antiquated and we, and it goes in the garbage and that happens all the time. But but what that means is, you know, it's 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 getting artists to think about themselves, identify, you know, be, be self-aware, understand what it is they do well, what they don't do well, teach them how to build a team, when the right time to build a team is, and how to collaborate and work well with others because nobody can do it on their own. And, you know, with the belief that everybody, you know, deserves their seat and everybody earned their chair in the program, they all have talent and they all deserve to be there. Utilize the relationships that you make both with faculty and with students in the in the program 
to create, you know, a world of your own. And that's what we really try and do. Absolutely. Uh, let me ask you, Jeff, how much interaction and integration do your students in the music business program have with the real world music business community of record labels, you know, publishers, recording studios, streaming companies, distributors and, and artists, etc.? A lot. Um, you know, it, it ranges from, well, first of all, we don't have academics. Every, every faculty member is a working professional in the music industry. So they're getting, you know, e even in terms of how the classes, even the tone, the, the, the relationship with faculty, it's, it's very different. You know, everybody calls me Jeff, you know, it's, you know, I treat them like professionals and they treat me like an industry, you know, professional, you know, it's, it's our, 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 our tone and our relationship with students is, is very different. So there's that aspect. We have guest speakers all the time. We have people coming in on a regular basis. We have mentors. We have internships. And being in New York, you know, our students are constantly touching, um, you know, all kinds of people. You know, whether whether it be you know Questlove teaching a class. You know, Swiss Beats was our producer residence. Pharrell was our artist in residence. We regularly have um, seasoned professionals and experienced people interacting with our students in a, in a professional way. Based on everything that we've been discussing here, what skills beyond just, you know, book smarts or, or knowledge uh, are important for students to develop themselves if they want to have a thriving career in today's business, in your for opinion? For me, it, it, it's, it's, it's a really simple answer. They have to know how to read the room. You know, they have to know where they are, who's there, how to communicate with people. It's, you know, we're, we're living in a, in a time where a lot of kids don't know how to communicate anymore. They, you know, they, 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 they write in text and Snapchat and, and, and they don't know how to interact with people in a meaningful way. And we're trying to get them to communicate and understand how to communicate with people, what the right time is. You know, look, this is a business where, you know, it's always been us versus them, the desperates versus the, the, you know, the insiders and everybody's trying to get on the inside. And, you know, we've tried to erase that in the sense that we want students to always feel comfortable in any room. And if there's an opportunity to know how to address that opportunity, whether it's to approach you and say, hey, hey you know, hey, Rich, you know, or Eric, is, is there is, is there any advice you could offer me? Or if they walk into a restaurant, and, you know, Jay-Z is sitting there with Beyonce and you want to drop like what's the right way to do that? It's understanding how to communicate effectively to portray yourself as somebody who isn't desperate and is worthy of attention. Um, and th that's a tough skill to teach. And we, we, we do our best. But look, I, I, I think that, you know, we're going to look back on, you know, social media 20 years from now as really being the devil in so many ways. It, 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 it really has alienated people more than it's brought them closer together. And I've tried to really focus on on uh, this is a business that is built on personal relationships, personal interactions. I mean, Rich, I've known you. I've known you as long as I've been in the business, and you know, and and I haven't spoken to you, and 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 I don't know the last time we spoke. But I get an email that you want to like I, the first thing I said. I would not only I love to do it. It's great to reconnect with you. Like, there's no substitute for that. Right. Right. Yeah, it's very important. The difference, and and that's what I try and teach. There's there's a difference between a contact and a relationship. And there's a difference between being famous and having a career. And those two things are very, very, very difficult to explain in today's day and age. And the way you, you do it, the way I do it is to hammer it home because it's a 20 year relationship that makes it easy for you and I to be doing this together. And, and I appreciate the opportunity, but you know, as soon as I see your name, it's it's like, oh my, I've known this guy 20 years. I'd love to it'd be great to connect again. Um, the fact that he wants me to talk, like I'm honored. And these kids think because they have, you know, this person likes a photo of theirs that they're thick as thieves. And that's just not <laughs> real. It's delusional. It's yeah. not fucking real. It's yeah. not real. And I, I try and hammer that home as 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 powerfully and often as possible. A contact is not a relationship, and a relationship happens face-to-face. -face. Let me ask you, Jeff. I mean, in listening to you, I, I get the impression that you also teach. Do you teach in the program as well? I do. Oh, good. Okay. Can you talk about that? Yeah. I, I, you know, I, I actually uh, – I generally teach the, the freshman intro to music business.
business. And 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 you know, being perfectly honest with you, that you know the subject matter is boring to me at this point. You know how I, you know, you know talking about what a manager does and how record deals work and what publishing is. It's very monotonous to me. But I love teaching freshmen. I love. I love the fresh faces. I love the excitement. I love the naivete. I love the joy. I, I love seeing these kids, you know, all being together and, and you know, be, being amongst, you know, the, their people for the first time. I mean, you know, the electricity is is tough to beat. But, you know, I'm, I'm sort of a pinch hitter. I, I tend to fill in where, where needed in the business area. I'll teach anything from entrepreneurship. I'll teach capstone. Uh, I even teach a... a, a a, a music and fashion class, which is a personal favorite of mine, a personal interest of mine, called the, called the Sound of Fashion. You know how music's inspired designers over the years, and 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 the clothing they create out of that, which usually is in line with what a lot of the artists are wearing. But um, y- y- I generally teach business area curriculum. So, but but freshman level intro to music business is one of my favorites. So now we call music business essentials. But but you know every full time faculty member teaches uh, teaches core classes. We all do advising. We all do um, you know review sessions with the students. We have a very intimate relationship with the students because there's so few of them. And we generally you know every student's hand picked, so we generally know each and every one of them. Certainly by the end of freshman year, if if not before then, you know it's only 60 kids per per class. So we have a total of about 260 kids total, 240 kids. Let me ask you, what surprises you most about the new freshman students who are coming into your program? What surprises me most is how uneven the landscape is in terms of what what these kids experience is of of of, of musical history. You know, you could ask a group of 30 kids what their favorite artist is and in half of them will mention artists you never heard of. It's a it's it's a it's a sub genre. It's a sub band and a sub genre of a genre you know and you've never heard of the band. So, you know, you, you put on you you could put on you know put on Ziggy Stardust video. Half the class is singing along every word, and the other half of the class is looking up, saying, "What what what is that?" Yeah, da- David, who? I, I yeah, exactly, right. exactly, yeah. Is it real? Is it fake? So so a lot of a lot of our freshman year is really dedicated towards building the foundational elements of everybody being on the same page in terms of understanding the history of popular music in America in the 20th century for the most part. Yeah, that's such an interesting point, Jeff, because I think, you know, you're younger than me, but you and I both grew up in an era when we had a commonality of history. Uh, We had a commonality of, you know, we knew the artists that were new, hot, up and coming. I mean, now I don't know anyone, even the, the hippest hipster who knows the new, hot and up and coming, except if it's maybe the one thing that they follow. We have all gone down so many, and and you articulated this a few minutes ago when you said the biggest thing that surprises you about your freshman class is the, the the lack of unity around their sense of history. It's like they've all gone down. We've all gone down a hundred thousand different music rabbit holes, and you know, as I always tell my students, if you're into Chinese hip hop sung in Hungarian. There's probably bands out there doing it, and there's probably right. blogs that are adherence to it, and websites that are devoted to it. I mean, you you get the point. It's like we we don't have, and and we see that, and that's that's a bigger issue than just music. We see that in all media. It, it is, and maybe I'm showing my age, but I I'm going to once again I'm going to blame social media. What social media has done, it has erased the notion of historical relevance and made and made made a moment bigger than a moment and make it feel like a memory when it isn't worthy of being a memory. So what, what happens is that you've, you know, like you'll say, you know where this comes from. And they'll say, not only do I not know where it comes from, I don't really care. So, so historic, but you know, like if you don't know where it came from, you don't know where it's going. And, and the problem is, is that all of the artists that they love that are successful, they know damn well where it came from. Right. But they don't realize that because, you know, look, we're, we're living in a dumbed down society, you know, and we're living in a, in a time where, you know, we're, 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 you know, you know, we're, we're, again, it's like, you know, we're living in a time where, where people want the gimmick and they don't really want the lasting because nothing lasts, you know, it, 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 it's gone. And so we're trying our best to make certain they know that it all comes from somewhere and where it comes from matters. You know, it, where it comes from matters because 
any great producer, any great songwriter has to have influences. They have to know where it comes from. They have to understand. I mean, look, you can't talk about, you know, for, for example, you, you want to talk about the beat. Oh, I love the Beatles, but I don't really care anything more than I just love the songs. You can't love the Beatles without understanding what was happening with race relations and the Vietnam War and drugs and the advances in technology and how, you know, the wall of sound and how Sgt. Peppers was the first album that couldn't really be performed live and why that matters today. It matters a lot. It matters a lot. It has it has impact today in the way records are made, in the way producers make records. And, and all those things really matter. And they need to understand that because otherwise they'll only the, the only thing they'll be able to do is be copies of the moment. And, and that'll make them a parody of the moment and not have any kind of lasting power. And we are very focused on, on people building careers. And to build a career, you have to know where it comes from. Do you find that your students are open to that? I mean, when, when you explain this, are, do, do you – I mean, first of all, I would think, you know, you're, you're talking about a Bachelor of Fine Arts student. That's a little different than somebody who's taking, in, you know, a, a, a one-time course or a community college course in artist management. It's a different caliber of student. It's a different level level of interest, I would think. So my question to you is, is, as the chair of that department at NYU, are you seeing an openness to what you've just articulated as what the vision and intention of the program is among your students? Yeah, that, 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 that's an astute observation. I mean, the, the, you know, the, it, we actually have a very interesting student body because what you have, I mean, NYU is such a difficult school to get into. I tell these kids at orientation, you know, these are, you know, 3.6, 3.7. That's the average and most of these kids are, you know, you know, are, are, are 1300, 1350 SATs, you know, not including the essay or, or, or what have you. These are these are, you know, kids that are, are, are top 10 in their classes in their high school. So, you know, historically, artists have been, you know, anti academic, you know, been much more on the outside. We've got very academically driven kids who are artistically motivated. So, yeah, they 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 drink it up in many ways, but you know the 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 flip of that is yes, they're they're open to it and they want to learn it. And I tell them all at orientation, I'm like, guys, I could never get into this program, and they laugh. And I say, I I'm not kidding, I would have never gotten into this program. Most of the faculty here wouldn't have gotten into this program. You know, we we all learned about the music industry by by getting you know ripped off or getting kicked in the teeth or doors slammed in our face, and we're trying to to teach you those lessons. Um, you know. And of course, the flip of that is, is when you have students who are who are extremely academically motivated and 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 we can talk about, you know, the, the problems with with education in America. You've got kids that are really, really good at memorizing and regurgitating, but they're not really good at taking risks. So yeah. artists who aren't who aren't willing to take risks generally aren't great artists. They're good artists and they're fine artists and they're okay artists, but they're not great artists. So we have to undo a lot of the programming of garbage high school education where, you know, they're graded on how well they regurgitate. You know, for me, I mean, honestly, I almost feel like, and I talk about this now, I don't even see the point of, of us giving grades. It should be pass fail. You know, giving grades at this level, I think actually feeds into that system of, you know, of them just wanting to do really well. And I say to them, like, nobody's going to care in eight years that you got a B minus in music business essentials too. Nobody's going to care. They want to know, you know, can you carry yourself? Do they feel comfortable with you talking to the artist? Do you have good ideas? Can you write business plans? Do you have marketing concepts? Do you have experience? Grades won't matter. Considering most of the people in the music business, you know, don't have advanced degrees, most of them were generally fuck ups and worked their way in because they love music and they worked hard and they, you know, they, they learned how to hustle. It's no different now. You still have to have those skills. Yeah. And, and that it's interesting because, you know, I've, I've also, I teach at MI, I teach at Musicians Institute. I've taught there since 2002. And the one thing that I see that's, that's, a sort of a pattern, which is why I was asking you what you observe. And Eric, I think, asked you, you know, what the thing was that surprised you the most about your students is that I see that, you know, it's the it's almost a a lack of willingness to completely. And in L.A., as you know, in L.A., there's no end to the amount of resources, labels, internships, organizations, networking opportunities, shows, and all of that stuff that you can go to. And I find that there's almost this like resistance toward 
you know, diving in and getting to know people. I say, go to the workshops, go to this, go to these conferences. If you can't afford it, ask me, I'll get you a volunteer position. You know, right. if it's, if you can't afford the 500 bucks, you know, I'll call so-and-so and see, can you volunteer for the day and get a tip? And I find that it's, it's, it's this like, you know, like there's not this, I guess the point I'm making is that, and, and I'm wondering if you see something different. I see that when I started teaching years ago, there was a, there was a singular motivation to getting in to taking these classes. Today, I find there's a multitude of reasons why people go to school. Do you find the same thing in your program among the students? Well, I mean, look, to, to, you know, for, for me, I mean, look, you know, I have kids of my own. You, my kids told me they want me to spend, you know, a, a significant amount of money to send them to school to learn the music business. You know, that that's a real leap of faith that a parent has to take. I mean, they have to really want it. I mean, most of our kids, this is all they've ever done since they were 12, 13 years old. So, you know, they've done a good job of convincing their parents. I, what I'm hearing from you is... I mean, what I think I'm hearing, and tell me if I'm wrong, is that there's 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 a hustle or a fire in the belly lacking to by any means necessary to break into the business. Yes, and 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 I experienced that a lot. Okay. I think that you know we we you know uh, kids are entitled. They are. You know they've a lot of them have been spoiled. A lot of them, you know, a lot of things have been given to them. A lot of them aren't really sure and don't want to do the work to find out. They want to know. What's in it for them before they extend themselves? And I think that's a generational thing to a degree. And okay. look, for us, it's super frustrating. But by the same token, the five or six that that will eat, sleep, breathe, do whatever it takes, they stand out. And and there's always going to be those five or six. And look, you know, I have I have there there are kids that were in my class at, at Musicians Institute way back when who are now working in, in the business and they were the standouts in my class then. So I, look, I think I, I think that in many ways, you know, and we started off by talking about this, many of the uh you know the holy grail, you know, Ten Commandments those will never change. You know, those who are, you know, those who are the thirstiest and, and work hardest are, are going to get, you know, the biggest cup to drink from. And I still think that in our business, those are, the, you know, those are the people that, that people want to hire, not the degree, not where they came from, not the recommendation. It's the kid who shows up every single day and won't leave until you leave and, and just shows you they want it more than anybody else. And, and for a business, you know, that is made up of, you know, good times and concerts and all that, you know, historically, all the people that I know that are successful have worked their ass off. You included, me included, you know, have, have, have made real sacrifices to be successful in the business. And people do work really, really hard, even if it looks like a good time. It still is the music business. It's not the music friends. And the successful people work hard and grind it out. And I think that's what it is with a lot of the students. They don't realize, oh, this is a business. I have to work at this. They see, you know, what's portrayed to them on television. And, and I think that that's a big part of it, too. There's an illusion there. And when they realize, oh, shit, I got to actually work at this and I got to bust my fucking ass at this, then it's like, whoa, is Again. this really what I want to do? Yeah. Right. It's exactly. It's what they see. It's like, you know, I took my son who's 13. I took him to Rolling Loud, him and a couple of his friends for, for three days of, of, you know, hip hop. And, you know, I used to manage DMX and DMX performed. And my son wanted me to explain why was he so different? Why do people love him? I said, you know, he came out in a time when everybody was talking about cars and, 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 and women and, 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 you know, and Moe and everything else. And he came out, was talking about his neighborhood, his friends, his cars, and he wore a silver chain and a white T-shirt. And he was different. He stood out. Um, and every artist, you know, it's, it's become a parody parody of itself. You get every artist talking about it. It's, it's like, you know, you know, when Lil Wayne showed up with face tattoos, it was shocking. Now, if you don't have a face tattoo, you're not hard enough, exactly. you know, like, <laughs> it, it, you know, hip hop yeah. goes through this, this cycle where, where it becomes a parody of itself. And we're in the airport flying back and there was a, a you know, there was a kid there who had released a single or two who performed one or two songs. My son saw him. And he said, how come he's not flying private? I'm like, <laughs> that's I'm the like, illusion. Wow. That's the illusion part. Yeah, that's the illusion. I said, I said, why would he be flying private? He's like, well, is it is isn't he rich? Oh exactly. That's yeah. the other that's the other yeah. perception. He said, well, he's got a song. He's got all these followers. He's got 
And I had to explain him that it, it's just not, it's not so. Being famous and having a career are two very different things. Yeah, or being famous and having a career and having money are, are radically different. I mean, you could have a platinum album and still not have, you know, any money. I, I, I want to just go back to one point that you, you mentioned before, which was, you know, that, that there's so much of, of this um, aspect with, with artists today. And, you know, I mean, I look at somebody like Billie Eilish and I think, you know, here's somebody who's changing the paradigm. Here's somebody who's having massive pop success that's coming from an entirely different place uh, culturally, um, musically. And she's appealing to a lot of elements uh, within the pop sphere, if you will, you know, culturally, musically, artist wise, you know, audience wise. Um and it gives me this sense that, you know, I think to be a successful artist today in, in that vein, you have to be unique. You have to have, you know, not only good music, but you also have to have a really strong personal narrative. And I find that if artists don't have that, it's really hard. And, and, and part of that to me is the idea of, you know, putting your, your life and what you're about out there. And not every artist is willing to do that. You, you know what? You're you're 100 percent right, because. Everyone, artists are so desperate, desperate to be successful, to be famous, to be rich, that they don't know who they are, nor are they, or, or they know who they are, but they're willing to sacrifice and chip away at that to do whatever other people tell them they need to do in order to have an audience. And, and one thing that will never change, has never changed, I mean, look, if, if you look at how Taylor came out, or if you look at... How, how Gaga came out or how, how Billie Eilish came out sure. or how Madonna came out. It's all exactly the same. If you know who you are, who your audience is and how to communicate with them, that is the, the trifecta of success. And so many of them have nothing to say, which is why the producers have become the real stars of pop music because the, 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 the artists themselves are, are empty vessels. You know, that's, they'll, they'll that's sing the anything, problem. they'll do yeah. anything. So yeah, Billy, I mean, Bill, Billy is no different than Gaga. It's no different than, than Taylor. Taylor spoke to a, a group of people in a language they understood. Completely, and she, yes. Was, was. Billy's the same way. Yeah, and Gaga. she wrote her own songs. Yeah. So did Taylor on the first two or three albums. Yeah, and that's it. And and the minute you start sacrificing who you who you are, are chipping away at that in order to, to, to find people, you're losing people. And that's why I think it's so important that artists really understand, like know who they are. And that's, you know, that's something that I focus on all the time. Like, like cut out all the noise and all the bullshit and what you think everybody's doing or getting on the bandwagon. You just have to put your blinders on and do you. Because we're living in a time where like, you know, no, nothing is retro, nothing is futuristic, nothing, I mean like, Technology has erased all of those things. Everything's rock. Everything's pop. Everything's hip hop. Every everything's. I mean, look at Post Malone for Christ's sakes. I like. I don't even know what you are, but what you are is successful because you're doing. Yeah. You, it's got every genre known to man in it. He looks like God knows what. He sounds like God knows. I can't even describe him. Yeah. I, now it, I wasn't a fan because I did. I couldn't figure out who he was. But after listening and seeing and learning and understanding, he's happy with with a, with a house remix. Just like he's happy with with a dark ass hip hop remix, or a pop or, or pop version, or playing with you know Aerosmith or playing with the Peppers, like you can be you, you know, the minute you try and be everything to everybody, you're nobody. But but as long as you're doing you and you're owning that, that's the pathway. Because the one thing that never changes is authenticity stands out all day long. And when you're lost and you don't know who you are or what you stand for or, or what's important to you, how do you expect anybody else to know? Yeah, you can't. You can't find an audience. Jeff, if you could change one thing in today's music industry, what would it be? I, I, I would really, really love, I, I think what's needed the most, and I don't have the, 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 the platform for it. I have an idea, but I don't, I don't, have, I don't have the idea. I would really love to see more artist development. I think there are a lot of artists who with just a little bit of guidance could go a lot further. And unfortunately, you know, you have the ability to, to reach people one-on-one -on -one now, which I think is a, is a beautiful thing. 
but you know, it's, it's erased a lot of that development. I do think, um, you, you know, I, I, I still think that the, the price of entry is too high for radio. I wish that were different. Um, but, but I, I would just say, I would put that all under artist development. I wish there was a more meaningful way to take really good talent and ma- and help make it great. And I, I would love to participate in that because that's what makes me happy. That's what I love doing. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't need to be there after that. You know, like to me that like helping somebody be their best is enough for me. Like, and I think that's missing because we're living in a time where artists don't really get that chance to do that in front of, in, in, in front of an audience anymore. You know, what's interesting about that answer, Jeff, is that I was reading an article in Billboard about three or four months ago, and they were talking about this very issue that it was Atlantic Records who had signed, I think, like four or five acts who were so fresh and new based on, you know, streaming or data. They had no, not only did they not have like a body of work, they didn't have any material, nor had they ever performed live. So they were like teaching them how to perform, how to connect with an audience, how to, you know, go out and promote not only their record, but to have, you know, an additional three or four songs in a set. I mean, it's like, you know, it, 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 they were speaking right to the heart of what you are talking about it. And, and, you know, I can remember when I was an A&R person and I know when you were an A&R person, the very first question out of our mouths when we heard something on tape or CD that we love, the very first question is, wow, when can I see the act? When, when can, I, can see I see you play live? live? Exactly. That's the first question. And now it's like, you know, what? <laughs> Not only, do they not, not only do they not, so many of them don't, who are getting deals, I mean, but that's like, you know, that's anthemic to the consciousness. And I, I find that strange given that, you know, we're talking major label acts here. And it and goes... Way, but Rich, but also what about what about the on the executive side? Kids don't know how to be... Yeah, like, how do you learn how to be a manager? You know, you make mistakes. I made a ton of mistakes. And, and, you know, labels don't want to sign acts if they don't know the manager. Well, there's there needs to be more managers, more good managers. Or, or how do you learn how to market? How do you learn how to do festivals? Like there needs to be more training and more guidance. You know, that that's something which I think is really, really missing and lacking. Um, oh, very much so, like especially at the executive level. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Because I look, I, I I think good good leadership, you know, breeds better artists. So you know, look, I, I think I think I think the middle class of of music is missing that space between you know young, fresh, exciting, hungry, and and some talent and actually making it. That road, I think, is 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 has, has actually that gap has widened because I think it's become harder and harder. It's easier to to find your thousand fans. But it's harder to get to that next level. And I, I wish that were different. I wish there were a mechanism for that. Yeah, I, I, I do, too. I, I, you know, that's something that has been talked about a lot in these conversations that, that Eric and I have been having with people is that, you know, we hear that phrase a lot, that the middle class of touring is gone. The middle class of artists is gone. You know, that I mean, we were talking with somebody this morning. You remember Judy Stakey. Oh, love Judy. Love Judy. And she was saying, like, you know, that that whole middle class of like, you know, like, you know, we would be aware of not somebody who was a platinum artist, but like an Elvis Costello who had a lot of credibility. He wasn't a multi-platinum seller, but he always had a deal. He always put records out. They were always critically. And that kind of act in this era is completely gone. That sense of, you know, so much of that development process has been put back onto the artist or the manager themselves. Or when's the last time you saw a label sign an artist who, who you say, look, yeah, they're not, you know, a huge seller, but, you know, they're an artist artist. But I don't even where there are no artist artists anymore that that are that are, you know, in that sphere. But look, I, I think that, you know, I think that that it's an exciting time now because I think that, you know, look, I think that that, you know, the Spotify, you know, the, 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 the money situation has calmed down a little bit. I think that, you know. You know, it's, it's scaled to the point where people are getting enough money, where they're, you know, they're not griping all the time. And, and, and you know, I, I think that we're about to enter an era of, of abundance in many ways. And I'm hoping that's that's an area that that sort of that rises. Yeah. No, absolutely. And, and, you know, speaking of that, you just reminded me of something. I was reading an issue of Billboard last month and, and and I should send this to you if you missed it because it was really, really fascinating. It was Billboard Bulletin and it was 35 pages long. And here's why I think it was so interesting, especially for what you know, you're doing and what we're talking about. They profiled 
33 jobs in the music business that did not exist three years ago. And it was fascinating given that they were, given the fact that they were across the entire spectrum of the industry. They were jobs at labels. They were jobs at talent agencies. They were jobs at streaming services. I would love to see that. Uh, Oh, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, these were gigs that didn't exist. These were things of, you know, like UTA that hires a, you know, a, a music branding person and, and, and all these kinds of unique things. I mean, that's just one of the more mundane ones. But there are 33 jobs that literally did not exist that there are people out there across the spectrum that have full time employment at Atlantic, at UTA, at ICM, at Columbia Records, at, you know, all of these at studios film, TV, commercials that did not exist. And I think this would be fascinating for you and for your students to know about that there are new, fresh opportunities. I would, I'd love to see it. P- please send it to me right after we finish. I, 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 really- I absolutely will. I absolutely will. You you will find it. And you should get it to all of your teachers because... Oh, I'm going to. Yeah. 100%. I, I guess my, my question on that is, do you try to encourage... Because one of the things I try to do, and it's, it's, it's a battle... Uh, as I try to get my students, I always am encouraging my students. And, and, and you know who taught me this was Clive Davis, uh, who lives by this to this day. He taught me the value of reading, the value of keeping abreast of what's going on in your industry. He said, you know, I do not, even at my level, I don't ever take that for granted. I don't ever think. It, it's tough. It's t- I mean, you know, I, 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 I preach it. We all preach it to, yeah. to be up to date trends on deals, on and it's not, it's not easy. No, it's, it's really not, easy. especially today. But it all comes they, to they you. They don't see value in it. They, they just, don't. They, I know. They don't, but I will say, though, but you know, a lot of them do read Billboard. A lot of them do hear about – they tend to follow news and deals of artists, but they don't follow enough on the business side of things as they should. Yeah, and, and I'm thinking especially your students who are committing time, energy, money, uh, a commitment, and a dedication to a field that – you know, they, they should be. And I'm not it's, I'm not lecturing. I'm just saying they, you know, these people in particular who are giving that kind of time, energy, commitment and focus to this business should be informed. And the thing is, is that, you know, when I came up, if you didn't have 400 bucks for a billboard subscription, you were kind of screwed. But nowadays, all that comes to you. You don't have to leave your house. It will come to you on your phone. It will come to you on the, you know, computer. So, you know, I, they, they, they all, you know, and all in different ways that, you know, they, in varying degrees are, are sort of in, in touch with it. They tend to know the new companies that are involved in when artists are successful, everything is centered around. If they're hearing noise, they want to know where the noise is coming from. But, you know, as you and I both know, oftentimes, you, you know, they, the, the smoke happens, you know, months, years you know, behind closed doors before the fire. And, and that's something that, you know, we try and, and, and get them to key on, but, um, you know, that's to very varying degrees, but certainly not to the level that you and Clive are talking about and, and, and not for lack of effort. Yeah. It's just something that I, I, I guess it's something, and it's interesting because I never did it in my twenties when he was teaching it, but I learned over the years, the value of that. Um, just from the point of view of what I do, which is teaching. I mean, I bring that that kind of new stuff into the class all the time and try to point those things out to them only because I think it's so important. Plus, I think that today it's so abundant. You know, those resources and the, that information, you don't have to go out and search. It will come to you if you're just willing to keep abreast of it, like Music Business Worldwide, Billboard.biz, you know, I bought, I mean, all of the different kinds of, you know, things that are interesting to their, to their world that they're giving time, energy and attention to. It's totally true. And if anything, you know what the problem is? There's too many things. Yeah, I know. You know? I know. So what we do is we give everybody suggested readings and things to follow, not only as a group, but in individual classes. Yeah. You know, look, I, I, I think that they, 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 you know, that, that I'd say that the sweet spot is certainly you know, what's happening culturally, or if a brand is doing something with an artist, or if there's a certain deal that's taking place, they tend to know about that. But, but it, look, you, you know, that, that where the, where the homework is done is, is, you know, that, that's, that's where it's at. I mean, that's, that's the, that's the real, um, that's the real hidden advantage. Yeah. Jeff, speaking of homework, are, are there any particular books, films, TV shows, et cetera, that you would recommend to those who are seeking to have a career in this business? 
you know, on the business side, there's there, there aren't many. You know, I've always found the greatest the greatest books about the music industry are the biographies. And, and when you go and you, and you read, you know, when you, when you read the books about, you know, individuals, whether it's, whether it's even reading a book about Steve Ross and how, you know, how time Warner, how, you know, how that merger took place. Um, or, or, or you read Clive's book and you understand the history and what people went through, or even, um, you know, Hitman, things like that, you know, all those books are, are, are super important and, and, and very valuable. I also find, um, you know, h- historical stories, you know, just, you know, ju- you know, just kids, you know, that, that was a great book to understand, you know, what was going on in New York at that time. And, you know, whether it's, you know, with Patty and Robert Mapplethorpe and how that affected fashion, music, the downtown scene, the drug culture. What I always try and get kids to understand is, is how movements don't happen. You know, be, be, you know, m- movements happen because it's a, it's a, it's a, convergence of five things all at once hip hop didn't happen hip hop could have only happened in new york why because of what was happening uptown with the dj scene downtown with the basquiat art scene and warhol and and what was going on with fab five freddy at the mud club because he had relationships in the jazz club like those things could only happen in certain places the kids were tagging the subways like all of those things matter and 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 so when you understand how how things all come to a head i think that it gives people ideas on how to create movements of their own so those are the things that are important other than that you know the, the dailies you know I, I i agree with you billboard biz and billboard it's it's important and to understand what's happening just in the stock market understand what's happening with the big studios and, and, and just, and, and knowing what's happening culturally, I think is really important. You know, it's interesting. You brought up the name Steve Ross and it's, it's funny. I used to know Steve Ross uh, when I worked at the Beverly Hills hotel and it was right when I was like doing my internship at A&M. And I of course knew who he was. And whenever he would come to the hotel, I used to pick his brain. And he said one of the most um, insightful and impactful statements that I've ever heard anyone say about the music business when I asked him the question and I asked it kind of innocently I said you know I gotta ask you I said you know it seems to me and this was like in 1980 when right like when I was an intern I said it seems to me Steve that you know among all the record companies that the same people they just keep rotating the same executives like they they go from one to the other to the other to the other I said why is that and and I'll never forget what he said he said you know why he said because the boards who appoint the presidents and give me my job. He pointed to himself. He said they feel much more comfortable giving the job to someone who has done it, regardless yep. of how well they've done it, than they do to an outsider or to a stranger. And yep. I thought, my God, I mean, only someone of his experience and insight could make a statement like that and it's remained with me for 39 years. You know, I've never, ever forgotten that. And by the way, and it hasn't changed. No, I know. I know. Look at D- Doug Morris is a classic example of that. And Doug Morris was just simply a, a record company head at the time. And now he went on over the last 40 years to run literally all three major yeah. labels. Yeah. The ma- yeah. Excuse me, major label groups. I mean, that's yeah. like the perfect illustration of that. Yeah. Uh, of, of that point, you know, they run from one to the other, 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 you know, and uh, it's it's just fascinating. So anyway, what advice do you have today for artists or up and coming industry professionals who want to have a career in this industry? It, it, for, for me, I mean, I, I, I hate to sound old. It, 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 it's blocking and tackling. It's fundamentals. Everybody is, you know, you're you're you're. You know, if you're trying to make the most noise today, then you're 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 no different than anybody else. It's you know, it's it's blocking and tackling. Meet people, do good work, work hard, know what's going on. You know, be be in touch with what's happening. Work at your craft, at your skill. You know, be a student and learn and listen. You know, like shut up and stop bragging and and listen. And that to me is 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 you know, it's, it's, it's most important. It's like, you got two ears and one mouth, you know, but, but it just seems we're living in a time where everybody wants, wants to, wants to, to spout their mediocrity and their inexperience instead of listening and learning, which I think is, you know, it's becoming a lost art. Yeah. The era where everybody's talking and nobody's listening. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Jeff, Jeff, I cannot thank you enough for taking the time to do this. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, thanks so much. Jeff. Thanks for having me. Thank you.
I, I have always loved Jeff. He, you know, I've known him for many, many years, as he mentioned on the interview. And I remember I first met him when he was writing for Hits Magazine. Right. He was doing that in, this must have been 1994, mm-hmm. 95. Right. Uh, when, you know, it was an entirely different business. And, you know, he was very, very good at finding talent, as we've learned. You know, he found certain artists. Mm-hmm. He developed his career. And, you know, I love the thing when he said, you know, when he went to learn, when he went to work at the firm. Right. Now, the firm was run by a very, very great manager named Jeff Quantnitz and Michael Green. It was a it was a huge management right. firm, one of the biggest. Lincoln Park. I mean, yeah, and it was a... built on like, you know, one of those new kinds of, of models. models, you know, in the way that Irving Azoff had built, you know, the large management firm or Howard Kaufman or any of those people. Jeff and uh, Mike had built this in in a certain way, and they had a, it had a specific character and personality and vision. And I love what Jeff said about letting go of some of the preconceived notions that that's what he learned there. You know, because managers traditionally, as you know, they're used to being lone wolves right. doing everything on their own. Exactly, and that's what he st- stated in the uh, during the interview and how. It was a team effort over there. Exactly. And that that was a real team effort. And that you had a team. I mean, imagine what that must be like to be able to, you know, go down to the office two doors down and be able to get somebody to handle this aspect or somebody to handle this where you don't have to do, you know, we talk about that all the time where, you know, you have to handle everything yourself. And, you know, there's a different kind of consciousness when you're in a a company where that is possible. Right. And I think he talked about, too, the game being elevated and that, you know, it was good to be part of a big team and how he kind of correlated and related it to or the the analogy he gave was like surviving basic training coming into that kind of environment. Exactly. And he said he still, you know, looks to those people who he worked with as, you know, we all came through this together. Exactly. Yeah. Um, One of the other points I thought was great was uh, talking about, you know, how does N YC music biz program, you know, prepare students in today's landscape uh, versus, you know, kind of before. And, uh, you know, I think they offer one of the first bachelors of fine arts that are available, you know, uh, with their business program. It's a very unique program. Yeah. It's a music business program at the Clive da- NYU's Clive Davis right. School. And the thing about it is that, you know, like what I thought was so interesting about that part of it, Eric, was that he spoke about how they're not trying to make you, you know, necessarily a better musician. Right. They're trying to create a sense of your entrepreneurial spirit. Correct, which I really in love. In the world. Right. Which you and I, I mean, this is right this, to the yeah. heart. Not only harping on it, but it's part of our DNA. Right. It's part of who we are. It's part of who you were long before I met you. Right. It's what I think drew me to you is that you had that deep understanding of an artist and you had it before, I think, the consciousness of the culture artistically had right. shifted to where now artists need, need that. Exactly. You won't survive right. if you don't have that today because the world of I'm just an artist and I'm hoping somebody sees my talent and that whole system... Has, is, is gone. gone. Right. So it's not that you have to have a PhD in business as an artist, but you do need to know a lot more than what you did, you know, five, ten years ago. And what I love is that, you know, it's the whole idea like us here at Mubu TV about that they want to provide that holistic 360 degree approach to their career, not only from an entrepreneurial standpoint, but giving them the tools that they need in order for them to succeed, which I think is really great. Absolutely. And I think one of the things along the giving of the tools that he said that really struck me, and it struck me because, you know, I, I have taught for the last 30 years is the whole idea of teaching students, and it's a tough skill to teach how to read a room yeah oh how to go into a situation and read a room and he talked about why that's so tough today is because you know social media has isolated people correct it's their own silos yes where they don't have to interact right and this is not a business where you can isolate in some office and just you know have a relationship via text you can't get artists signed that way right you you know it's the world of the music industry at least now it doesn't work that way right it, you it's know, all relationship based it's relationship based and he said a very interesting thing about that which I thought was fascinating he said that you know there is quite a bit of difference and he said never forget between having a contact, contact and, a, yeah, and having a relationship was, I thought that was brilliant that was brilliant because that's somebody who really knows the distinction between right. the two you can have a contact but you know do you have a relationship and if you don't that's okay but are you busy 
busy developing them. Right. If you look at any, any of the great entrepreneurs uh, in music, all of them were brilliant at building relationships, whether it was Barry Gordy, whether it was Clive Davis, whether it was Ahmed Erdogan, whether it was David Giff. I mean, any of them right. always had that particular that ability. Set, yeah. They weren't, you know, isolated people in ivory towers. Right. And you, and you can't be, um, yeah. And, and, and moving with that, uh, subject, uh, as far as the, uh, skills beyond book smarts with students to develop, you know, their skills in today's music business, uh, I, I thought, what he really said really hit home with me was about feeling comfortable and knowing how to communicate more on what we were talking about earlier and about the whole idea of uh, being able to be comfortable uh, speaking to people, which gets back to what we were talking about, about the communication aspect. So many students, and I don't know, I'm not saying it's all young people, it's not, but a lot more than when I remember, and I've been teaching for a long time, did not have that skill. They don't have that skill anymore. And I think it's because it's a learned skill. Right. You know, yeah, there are people who were born more talkative and whatever, but it's a learned skill. And so, you know, one of the things he was talking about is that, you know, cell phones and texting and social media has really inhibited that skill just in the world from being developed. Right. More so. And that's a very, very important one, too. The other thing that he mentioned, which I thought was really interesting about, you know, students today is the uneven sense of history that right. they, that many of them in the music business. Remember, this is I'm not talking Joe Schmo on the street. Right. But in the music business where you want to make music your career, the uneven sense of history where yes. some of them you could put on, you know, David Bowie, Ziggy Stardust, and half of them will be like singing along and knowing it. And the other be like, who is this? Exactly. Yeah. Really interesting. I mean, do you see that? Among I definitely young- do. I mean, I definitely do. And it's something where I think we were talking about it earlier that I think it's, you know, probably an age thing. And eventually they do discover it, whether it's, you know, like a game of like rock band where they listen to music and they're like, oh, wow, that is really cool. That was a really great vehicle for a lot of those classic rock bands at the time that, you know, there was that new generation coming and they had never heard of who these bands were prior to that. And then they started to fall in love with it. Uh, you have other examples. Uh, I'll I'll say this show, Supernatural, which is a huge, huge show. Uh, their music supervisor plays a lot of that old school classic rock music. And there's a whole new legion of people that have come up with that show that now have fallen in love with like Carry On My Wayward Son from Kansas. Kansas from 40 and, years ago. From 40 yeah. years ago. And, and so it, it's really one of these things where I think ultimately they do discover it, but it's probably in their own time. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, you know, my whole thing is, is that you don't need to know the whole history of music, but you need to be engaged. If, if anything, what he's saying is, you know, people get engaged, you know, have, have that history become part of your own musical history. Hey, Insiders, thanks so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. To get show notes, links, and everything that was mentioned during this interview, head on over to our official website at mubutv.com forward slash podcast forward slash show notes. If you're enjoying the content and what we're doing here on the show, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. And don't forget to rate and review our show over at iTunes. Five-star reviews are always welcome and help to ensure that our podcast stands out on the top rated and new and noteworthy charts on iTunes in our space. You can also find us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all ending with the handle MubuTV, which is spelled M-U-B-U-T-V. Don't forget to catch our flagship show, the Mubu TV Insider Video Series, airing every week on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash MubuTV. This show was produced and created by Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. This show would not be here if it weren't for our amazing team, which are the following. Interview editors, Sarah Nissenbaum and Alex Taylor. Show notes and transcriptions by Jani Chang, Nicole Caboteglo, Lilia Owens, and Sarah Nissenbaum. Theme music by Disciples of Babylon. And be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the MUBU TV Insider Podcast.